Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll on Bill 34-18? Council Bill 34-18, Mr. Trapp? Yes. Mr. Scala? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Pitzer? Yes. Ms. Peters? Yes. Mr. Trees? No. Mr. Ruffin? Yes. And Madam Clerk, could you read the consent agenda, please? Items on the consent agenda include bills 3518, 3618, 3718, 3818, 3918, 4018, 4218, 4318, 4418, 4518, 4518, 4518, 4518, 4518, 4518, and resolution 2218. And Madam Clerk, could you read the consent agenda again and then call the roll? Bills 3518, 3618, 3718, 3818, 3918, 4018, 4218, 4318, 4418, 4518, 4618, and resolution 2218. Mr. Trapp? Yes. Mr. Scala? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Pitzer? Yes. Ms. Peters? Yes. Mr. Treese? Aye. Mr. Ruffin? Yes. And Madam Clerk, could you read resolution, moving on to new business, resolution R23-18. Council Bill 2318 is a resolution declaring support for community-oriented policing. Do we have a staff report? Yes. Uh, at the request of Council Member Thomas, uh, we have a draft resolution uh, to declare the City Council's support for community-oriented policing. Uh, that's in front of you to, uh, tonight. You define parameters of policing, community-oriented policing, and you're directing me to design a citywide community-oriented policing program uh, and then to come back with that by uh, August 31st. Mr. Thomas, you want to make any opening comments? I'll just comments? make a real real brief comment. Yeah, we've, we, this has been on our agenda for the last two meetings. It's back again, uh, scheduled for a vote tonight. Uh, we've received quite a bit of input from uh, city staff, from the public, and from various stakeholder groups, and um, they were almost all really, really good ideas, I think we all felt, and uh, wove those into the language of the ordinance, uh, or of the resolution. Um, Mr. Mathis has uh, uh, announced a procedure if we pass this resolution, which will be to identify a... Uh, a member of the police department, one of the officers, uh, who uh, is poised for an executive training opportunity to uh, spend six months in his office to lead this planning process and develop this plan by August 31st, as laid out in the resolution. Um, I certainly encourage you, Mike, and I'm sure you will, uh, to, to lean also heavily on Lieutenant Jones and Sergeant Hester, who are currently engaged full-time in implementing our pilot community-oriented policing program, as well as uh, continuing to engage with all of the stakeholders in, in developing this plan. With that, I just urge you all to support this resolution and move us forward towards a policing philosophy and program that I think just about everybody in this community believes is what we need. Any further discussion on the resolution? Mr. Scala. Yeah, I guess uh, there, there have been, uh, I, I appreciate all the work that you've done on this, uh, Mr. Thomas and, and Mr. Trapp. Um, and, I, and I think it uh, generally sets a pretty good framework for where we want to go, certainly uh, sets, sets a standard. A couple, couple comments. There have been some comments from the public, uh, some to uh, uh, specifically uh, attach uh, a few more uh, definitions, if you will. I think uh, 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 Mr. Clark offered uh, an attachment uh, or sent out an attachment to everybody having to do with um, some of the... Uh, uh, principles and topics and so on. I guess the question I have uh, uh, with the staff for any resolution is, I mean, I think all of that information is, is very valuable. It's, it's eventually going to be funneled down to the city manager who is in, in charge of kind of getting this all together, and I think you need to be mindful of that. Is there any way of attaching this to the, to the resolution such that, uh, or at least bringing it to your attention so you can review this information in conjunction with the rest of the resolution? I think it's probably, a, I, I mean, the way I see the resolution as it sits is, 
is, is, you know, I hate to say this, but it may be more detailed than what it is that we really need because it's up to the city manager in conjunction with the community to really work this out and, and get something that we can really implement. But nonetheless, so I don't want to get too, too bogged down in the details of this, uh, but just uh, but emphasize the amount of, uh, of uh, cooperation, this, this is going to collaboration this is going to take between the public and the city manager in terms of this, uh, the implementation of this resolution. If I may just respond, I, it reminds me this is a similar process to what we did with Vision Zero. And when we adopted our Vision Zero resolution, in a similar way, we uh, instructed Mike to develop a plan and to, to use uh, staff resources to do that over a six-month period. But we also gave him, and this really originated with the Pedestrian Safety Task Force, a, a binder of resources. Um, so I would strongly support including the resources that Mr. Clark sent us as part of a, a binder or a, an, an electronic binder of uh, different resources that we're all familiar with and some of the stakeholders as well are familiar with to be pre pre maybe put together in a somewhat formal way and I'm happy to coordinate that uh, to be something that you, you review as part of the process. Question. Mr. Any, anybody else want to be recognized before I go to Scal again? Mr. Scal. I just want to ask a question of, of, of the city manager then. I, I, I don't want, I mean, I, Vision Zero is obviously a tremendous program, I, I, but I think uh, in my caveat on it was that we kind of lost control of the process. I mean, this, this became a rather expensive process after starting out uh, rather modestly. I don't, I don't want to, <laughs> you know, I mean, want to put resources where resources are necessary, but will we have kind of a, 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 a interim reports along the way here to see where we're going and, and how much, you know, what, what kinds of costs we're incurring? I don't want to have sticker shock at the end of this uh, process uh, without some, some way of anticipating what that may be. We can attempt to do that. Uh, the Vision Zero process did not have interim reports. Uh, right. It was a pretty short turnaround. Frankly, this is a fairly short uh, turnaround, but uh, certainly could uh, uh, maybe have a halfway mark and at least give you, here's, here's everything we've gathered so far. Uh, you, you'll get everything that we get, and uh, it'll all be on the public record, and we'll consider everything as we come up with what you've asked for. Uh, the sticker shock is, uh, is going to be part of the report. You know, yeah. there'll be various uh, community-oriented policing strategies, some that don't cost a lot, some that do cost a lot. So uh, we'll explore all those in collaboration with every interested party. Uh, and then what we come back to you with will be very similar in my mind to the visions. Here's what we can afford today. Here's what you might afford in the future uh, if you go to a ballot or have some other means to have new revenue. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I think you can expect to see. But yeah. we'll, well, I would just I'll love to have a, a, a list of the strategies and, and at least ballpark figures as to how much you know, these are projected to cost before we get to the end of this road, that is the final report. That would be, to me, that would be very useful. I think we can do something along those lines. So why don't we do this? Let me go ahead and open it up for the public hearing and invite anybody that would like to uh, be heard on Resolution 23-18, declaring support for community-oriented policing to come forward. Ms. wilson Camp. Can I call you doctor yet? Where are you in that process? Not yet. Okay. Everybody take their vitamins. It'll be soon enough. Okay. Please Good proceed. evening, Tracy wilson Camp. Um, I'm sort of going to reiterate what I said this morning on the radio, but I'm saying this because feels like every time we talk about community policing, there's a little bit of a distraction, this thing about staffing and money. So I just want to, I want to pull it back again to the philosophy with this little brief caveat in the beginning. Um, there's a movie out that uh, called um, Three Billboards in Ebbing, Missouri. It's a fictitious place, um, but it's an interesting movie. I, I'm not crazy about it. Um, my dad saw it and my dad said, well, it's interesting. The message is keep on killing. All right. That's my dad's perspective. BBC will be here on February 28th, and we're going to have a larger conversation, broad strokes, about police and race. I use that example to say that what my dad is really saying is it's the status quo in terms of how we have the conversation about police and race. And so when I hear staffing and I, we hear this front-end conversation about money, 
we're not, I, to me, it's kind of a distraction from the reason that we're in this place is because we didn't invest the money as a political policy decision for 100 years. So there's a reason that we have these communities that are marginalized and have been neglected because that was a political decision that previous councils and previous mayors and et cetera made a decision about. So today in 2018, we're having to pay back and reinvest what we didn't invest in those times. So we're in this place with community policing because we didn't value those communities then. So I just want to caution this conversation about money and being extra concerned about the money because really, Community policing is about transforming leadership and transforming our practice of how we police. That is the number one thing that Race Matters Friends has been saying. We want you to embrace a philosophy. In the computer world, in technology, it was called re-engineering. The way that we used to use our business practices changed, and so we had to change software. They called it re-engineering. And there's lots of re-engineering that goes on. In every field, there's constant change. Policing is really no different. We do it in education. We do it in every field and every discipline has to embrace a realm of change and they have to relook at their practices. So my suggestion is the money part's really important. Mr. Mathis has a big job to figure this out, and as he said, in a, in a short period of time. But the issue is to transform your leadership to get different outcomes, to ameliorate the disparities because of the historical neglect of people of color and poor communities and that is the case today. So my challenge to you is to focus on how do we transform the leadership so that we have better outcomes. We can talk about the money, but the leadership matters. Thank you. Any further public comment? Good evening. Rachel Taylor, 119 Clinton Drive. And uh, halfway through is not sufficient for accountability. Part of the resolution calls very clearly for an accountability plan. That means check-ins. I've run global projects serving up to 90,000 people. Project management is not a one and done thing. I expect to see a schedule of accountable check-ins bi-monthly for every work stream. I expect the city to treat this project with the respect it deserves, not a 653 page unindexed presentation that was not made available to our citizens. So that was the stick. The carrot is thank you for listening to me and for including my recommendations in the resolution and listening to Race Matters Friends. Um, I'm really impressed that we have got as far as we have and that we are moving more quickly uh, since the Mayor's Task Force on Community Violence recommendations of 2014. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Any further public input? Mr. Cooper. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Chip Cooper. I uh, live at 500 Longfellow. And um, I sent you the same thing earlier today, but I'll just read it. Um, grateful for the depth and breadth of community engagement regarding the future of policing that has been taking place in our community. The relationship between citizens and taxpayers and their police force is central to our quality of life, peace of mind, and ultimately our economy. Thus, it's fitting and very healthy that we re-examine and debate this critical aspect of our government periodically. As you may recall, I have published several columns in the Columbia Daily Tribune regarding the impressive nature of the long-standing community-oriented policing program in our sister college town, Lincoln, Nebraska. Given uh, my up-close exposure to their approach to policing, I know that we, too, have legitimate, time-tested options to consider for our own approach as we move deeper into the 21st century. I believe this community that we love is capable of landing on an approach that will knit us closer together, make us all feel safer, and ensure that Columbia remains a place that many wish to live, work, learn, <coughs> raise families, and retire. Passing the resolution tonight will take us one step closer to our destination and continue the rich community discussion that we so badly need by directing the city manager to draft an initial plan for the implementation of a community-oriented policing philosophy and model, 
We will further sharpen the vision for Columbia's approach and allow more refined and granular consideration of what it could actually look like, cost, and what benefits it could yield. To keep the process moving, I strongly support the adoption of R2318, and I thank you very much for uh, your uh, dedication to this particular issue and everything else you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Any further public comment? President Ratliff, good evening. Good evening. Larry Ratliff, 211 Park, DeVille Drive, good evening. Um, I'm going to be very, very brief. <coughs> I am just going to rise to tell you, you know, how excited that we are in the community, that we are finally about to get to uh, the place where we've been trying to get for a couple of years now, and declaring uh, support by the NAACP and other community members uh, in supporting R23. 18, uh, I am sure that the, uh, we are going to continue to stay engaged, and I am sure that the community is going to stay engaged uh, in following up and making sure that we make the change that we are, that we envision that we can have for the city of Columbia. We are, the NACP is committed to uh, work uh, with you as long as it takes and, and work with you as hard as we can to make sure that we make Columbia, the beloved community, that is a place where we all want to live and where we can all dis be disagreeable without and still be civil to one to the other. When we have problems, uh, I'm sure that we will not agree with, with everything uh, that you decide to do in every way that you decide to do it and, and the same that you want to agree with everything that we say. But hopefully we can come together in a win-win situation for the city and the citizens of Columbia. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ratliff, when is your next citizen engagement meeting? Is that tomorrow or next Tuesday? Next, next Tuesday, the 27th. Would encourage you all to come out Thank for you that very occasion, much. okay? Very good. Thank you. Good evening. Chad McLaren, live at 1807 Jackson Street. Um, I was sitting back here and, and really kind of mulling over these things. I didn't really have a well-prepared um, concept laid out, so I apologize if it rambles a little bit. Um, I, I'm, I'm a 20-year retiree out of the United States Air Force. Uh, I spent probably 15 years of that time serving overseas, uh, observing other cultures, and certainly throughout the 20 years of my experience, our organizations have changed significantly. Um, just as kind of a reference, when I first enlisted in 1993, um, there were three commands, major commands that we had at work then. That was like the tactical, uh, strategic, and, and mobility airlift commands. And all the functions of the Air Force basically operated within those, with the exception of special operations, but they're special, right? Um, well, they decided to kind of condense this organization into two major platforms, Air Mobility Command, Air Combat Command. I happened to pick a base, um, Fairchild Air Force Base, which had a nuclear mission. Uh, we had B-52 stationed there. We had KC-135s, which were tankers, um, basically passed gas for in-flight refueling. Just to give you an idea of like the same organization but the two different missions, um, bombers during the Cold War, they had the mission to basically launch, get refueled, and make it to Russia, nuke Russia, and hope that they could coast after the EMP blew up their systems and just make their way into Eastern Europe. All right, so that's kind of an interesting mindset. You start thinking about the, the cost of the nuclear um, mishaps and those kind of things. They were very regimented in the way that they approached things. KC-135s on the opposite hand, stationed right across the street from them, were expendable. They were told they had to go out there and pass every drop of gas they had to the bomber to make sure that they could make their mission. In their wisdom, um, the military at this point decided when we go to reorganize all these different cultures, we're not going to take strategic air command and move them into the combat command like they should have, what they would have been used to doing. They thought, let's save money, let's look at, we have these two units right there, they're personnel, they work maintenance, let's throw them together. Okay, yes, it cost less money by doing this, but the outcome of that was disastrous. Uh, for the first six years that I was in the military, morale was terrible, and part of the reason was you had two different forms of culture at work vying here, and no clear leadership out of the process, and there was like no clear culture other than one of just um, confusion. Um, so I guess the one thing I want to say is like uh, money, I do understand that being the restriction on a lot of things, but you have to look at the cost of what comes if we don't invest the resources in these programs as we implement them. 
Um, I would like to say that leadership is probably the single most important aspect. If we're going to induce any kind of cultural change in any organization, you have to have buy-in, vocal buy-in from leadership. Um, not only that, but you also have to have measurements. People have to know how to operate when you're not looking over their shoulder. And they also need to be held accountable to reaching those measures. I mean, these are just very, very basic things. Um, so I guess like at my point, I would like to see some very vocal leadership out of, I think there's a lot of support here for like uh, the community policing, um, but it's going to take some real, real labor. Um, so I guess my, my last little um, thought is it really needs to be a matter of follow, lead, or get out of the way. There, there's not much for business as usual and for taking this piecemeal. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your service. And John J. Clark, attorney CPA, uh, certified uh, practitioner of community policing, has a 1999 training with the police department, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, two, or two or three things. Um, you got my memo. I sent it out to some other people. Uh, this is not yet ready. And of course, when I talk to other people, I said, oh, don't get the good, get, get in, in the way of the perfect. I'm sorry. I've been around a long time. I've seen a lot of good things. And I've seen a lot of things that didn't reach the minimum threshold of good. And when we follow those, as in fact the gentleman back here kind of indicated in his organization, it didn't work. Now's the time to, to stop and do that. What is this missing? What this is missing is starting out with the president's 21st century thing and basically dealing with the lack of legitimacy of the police force and its use of, of force and so forth absent the consent of the government. What you're talking about is doesn't get to that at all, what I suggested or my memo did too. There's also, and thank you Mr. Scala for mentioning it, there's not a definition of community policing in here. There's not a model, there's not a set of principles. I know the police department doesn't believe in the principles I listed. They believed in the problem-oriented style and so forth. So to turn this over to the police department when they don't believe in these kind of core principles just doesn't make any sense to me. No one in CPD is either qualified to guide this and so forth, plan it and decide it, independent because they all believe something entirely different. And they certainly really don't have the time in various ways. And we've heard that from various people. Even if you do this, you need to have somebody who has, who's independent, has independent subject matter specialist in that. So, of course, you can go to the Vera Institute for this. You can go to the CRS in Kansas City for that, the, this kind of stuff. Uh, you can go to Campbell DeLong, who taught the police department how to do strategic planning. You can talk to Chief Auden out of, out of uh, Greenville, uh, North Carolina. Mr. Mathis said he told you exactly what he'd come back with. He's going to pick various strategies from a community-oriented policing handbook. That's just piecemeal ad hoc nonsense. I mean, that will not get you a community policing-oriented model that you can gradually implement and so forth over time. This does not meet the minimum threshold of the good. And I must admit, I've read all the stuff from Lincoln, and just think about this. Lincoln has worked very hard and diligently on community-based policing for 40 years, and they've made all kinds of progress. And if you read what was written by the guy up there, he said, and we still have not made any real progress in involving the community in basically our policing actions. We don't have 40 more years to wait we don't have to wait 40 more years and pick those, very strategy, those various strategies out of the hat. Certainly, and I suggested this, and I'll just read as my final dissenter thing about this, if you adopt the, the principle of the importance, the degree to which police share decision-making authority with the community. In community-oriented policing, it emphasizes shared equal decision-making authority with the community. If you do that through a well-designed strategic planning process 
with independent outside help, it will, one, take you through all the areas that need to be addressed, evaluation, training, hire, all that kind of stuff. And in addition, it will function as the mechanism to provide community consent and therefore legitimacy to the policing system that comes out of that. This resolution, I know Mr. Thomas believes it will take us there, and he's seen a lot of things work and not. I've seen a lot of things. This is not ready until you start with legitimacy and a definition model a set of principles of community policing rather than what Mr. Mathis says is exactly what he'll do. He'll look at some things which, by the way, may or may not be really community policing strategies, but they're strategies, and that's all they are, and that cannot add up. It will lead to the kind of problems that the gentleman just before me referred to in another organization, because organizations are different, but organizations in many ways are very much alike. Thank you, Mr. I please, please consider this carefully. Thank, Thank you, you, John. Any further public comment? Mr. Love, good evening. My name is Paul Love. I'm a council candidate for the second ward and a resident um, in Parkade. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the idea of community policing. I'm pleased to see that some progress is being made towards uh, public safety. We've had some kind of issues with not a whole lot of support on that. And I'd like to bring a few issues that you want to look at that maybe weren't brought up this evening. Um, right now, morale in the force is very bad. 80% of them considered to be toxic. 68% of them are looking. I believe about 30% of the officers have been there less than two years. If you want to implement community policing, what that means is you need to have people who enjoy their jobs enough they stay around. It doesn't do any good to send somebody into the community, let them spend a year or two building relationships, and leave because he hates his job. Second thing to look at is staffing. Um, I know somebody mentioned we don't want to bring pricing into this, but as was mentioned last month, uh, earlier this month, um, we had that discussion about the fact we're over 100 officers short. That's the kind of force you're going to need if you want to conduct community policing. In case you want to know, that's an awful lot of money, guys. That's going to be some tough decisions you need to make. So for those of you who are making this decision tonight, I ask you to stop and think about that. Are you willing to make those tough choices? Because there's going to be some really ugly choices you're going to have to make in the future. You're going to have to look at management, not only in the way they conduct things, but in keeping the morale of these people up and keeping the resources that we have in our public safety. Okay, these officers have to want to work here, and we haven't done a good job with that. Um, I know my councilman has made some decisions that have irritated some of those guys quite a bit. Um, the way it is, it's the history we've got. But uh, I don't want you to make this an empty political statement. If you guys are going to approve this as something you want to go forward with, you need to make sure that you're willing to make those sacrifices. Ballpark, 130 officers, it's going to cost you about $13 million. Um, you're going to have to pull some of that from other places. You might get some of that from taxing. But honestly, you're going to have to improve your reputation if you think you're going to pass a tax for the, that in this town. Um, you know, I appreciate the effort that you're making in looking into this. But just remember, this isn't an empty vote for one night. This is a commitment you guys have to make for decades. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Love. Any further public comment? Good evening. Yeah, welcome back. Usually I'm working nights right now. But so am I. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, Mary. Um, I know I caught half of this, but to be honest with you, I know if I saw right, I think the chief of police is sitting in the crowd. But if you guys want to help com do this community policing, have the community not be so scared of the cops. I know I have a bad record. I've made some bad choices when I was younger. And I may not always like the police department for doing their job, but they did their job. So there are some officers I talked to, including the sergeant on the force, and I'd like to recognize him for doing a good job, which is Sergeant Meyer. He's a wonderful officer, and I swear, Officers like him and Officer Bishop became a cop to help the community, not crap all over us. If you guys want to know what it's like out there, 
take a ride with a cop and then come take a ride with me. Because I promise you, this isn't pretty out there. I watch college students walk right out in front of me in a crosswalk where they're not even supposed to cross. And there's a cop sitting at the light and they won't do crap. I watch people run red lights and almost hit me and still see a cop sitting there or within distance. And I know the cop probably saw it. Either that or it's texting on their phone. Me, that kind of stuff needs to stop. If you guys want our help, come out from behind your desk and come ride with us. Especially with me at night. I go to work from 3 to 5 in the morning. 3 at night to 5 in the morning. I'm at the one on 9th Street. You guys want to come take a ride with me and then come take a ride with a cop? Go right ahead. Because I can guarantee you, I rode with a cop down in Clute, Texas. Their job's not easy. And I promise you this, the community down in Clute is a lot better because of this type of program and the cops actually taking a step forward, even though they are shorthanded too. So if you guys do that, that'd be great. Remind me your name again. EJ Lynch, I live at 2916 Leeway Drive until the 27th of this month and then I'm moving to Demerit. Very good, thank you. I'm actually staying in town. All right, thank you Mr. Lynch. Good to see you again. Any further public comment? <clears throat> Mr. Roberts. I want to, I'm sorry, thank you for bringing this forward. Um, I think as it stands at, in its current posture, uh, the members of the Columbia Police Officers Association are really looking forward to being engaged in this project. Um, I appreciate the mayor's uh, suggestion from the last meeting and thank the city manager for taking him up on the idea of having us involved in the interview along with Chief Burton. Um, the city manager selected Sergeant Rob Fox to work with him one-on-one. -on -one. That's been announced and it's public information. Um, to have Sergeant Rob Fox lead this effort if, or, or coordinate this effort. I don't know if I should say he's leading it, but he'll be working <laughs> with the city manager's office and the interested parties in moving this forward. Um, we're delighted with that selection. Uh, Rob Fox has the knowledge and the skills and the ability to do something like this. He has experience working with the community, and I know he has great respect from our officers. He's a SWAT team leader or SWAT trainer, and our officers trust him, and I think that's a great step in uh, getting the officers to join in this effort. And. We just look forward to moving forward with this. Yes, there will probably be a cost to it. I think at the end, those difficult decisions about how much can we do with how many officers uh, will be another discussion that we'll just have to deal with it. But in the meantime, uh, we're ready to move forward. And, and uh, Councilman Thomas, uh, in as much as this was sort of your resolution, you should be delighted that it's one of your countrymen, uh, a gentleman <laughs> from Leicester, who, who is gonna be sort of coordinating this effort. So unless you have any questions, thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much. Any further public comment? <clears throat> Hampton, 202 Bay Point Lane. Good evening. Columbia. Um, and uh, I have a question. Um, the, um, Mr. When Mr. Love, but the development for me that just spoke, uh, Police Officer Association, says that uh, the, the leader of this has been announced, or, or the director that's going to direct the community policing efforts is Mr. Fox, who's a SWAT team. He said was his SWAT team leader, great recommendations. I don't know what SWAT team leader would have that would qualify him to lead the community policing effort. In fact, I think he was in charge in, uh, was it 2010, when they um, went into a home and shot a family's dog with kids present. There's a video of it that I watched. Uh, fellow Race Matters friends put it on. It's very disturbing. And I hate to think that he's going to be the head of our community policing. What is this? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hampton. Any further public comment? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on the resolution declaring support for community-oriented policing? 
Seeing none, I'll close this part of the hearing. Any council discussion? Uh, no discussion, but I would like to say uh, something. Um, as I was sitting here uh, listening to all of the comments, uh, I became aware that this is um, an exceptional uh, moment that we're experiencing because um, what, we, what, what we're witnessing is the Columbia Police Officers Association, the Columbia Police Department, the City Council, the officer of the city manager, uh, and various uh, community constituents all coming together in agreement that this is something that we need. That uh, in my time on the council, I haven't seen that before. And so this is an important moment that we don't want to overlook or, or discount. I always, I've always felt that uh, whenever you have an opportunity to uh, participate in a significant moment, that it's important to realize that there were those who worked diligently before you. Even though we have the opportunity to vote on this resolution and to solidify it as the spirit and the vision of it, we have to acknowledge all the hard work that has happened over the years that brings us to this point. We have to acknowledge that the work did not begin with us who are here tonight, and the work will not end with us. It will continue far into the future. But we have an important opportunity tonight to say, this is the spirit and vision of the community that we desire. This is the type of policing that we require uh, for our city, and we are here to make that happen and to set that vision for future generations. But um, we have to acknowledge the work of uh, Councilman Thomas, who, who did the, some of the critical work of drafting the resolution and the work of uh, Councilman Trapp and Laura Nauser, uh, who uh, guided the process for, for a couple of years that brought us to this point and for the engagement of diverse community groups who disagree on many things, but on this one thing, we're all in agreement. And uh, it is a living document. It is not written in stone. It is living. It is breathing. It will change. It will evolve. But it certainly sets the parameters and the vision for where we should go. And so I just want to say thank you for all of those who have worked so diligently in this season, but also for those who've worked before and those who will come after us who will continue this work. Any further discussion? <clears throat> uh, no one's eager to go after uh, Pastor <laughs> Ruffin. Um, Give you a chance to back out. Yeah, so, but someone needs to. Um, <laughs> And, and that was that was well said. I'm in, in agreement. I want to refer to this gentleman's comments um, that we need a clear statement from leadership. And this resolution, most significantly, is that clear statement from the political leadership that we endorse the philosophy and concept of community policing, and that we want to move forward with that in a real and practical way. Um, I agree that measures are going to have to be identified. Um, you know, we know that there is disparities in regards to race in our traffic stop data. We need to offer legitimate explanations where they exist, and we need to I identify practical measures to address those. That's something that, you know, the community um, it demands. Um, we also have, you know, ongoing issues in regards to morale and, and, and support for the police. We wrestled with all of these things with the Task Force on Community Violence. And this is, um, you know, the next step towards that. We have been trying to bring some things forward. We've certainly had um, missteps. We have been engaged in the issue. And some of our specific measures um, have been successful, and, and, and some have not. Uh, we continue to kind of stumble forward and try to address it with a greater competency and a greater sense of partnership and really the the most complete community partnership to address the issue that we've seen for a long time so i think it's important we pass this tonight and uh, i'm looking forward to being engaged in its implementation and and its follow-through that we can make it um a, a, a physical reality that everybody experiences fair and impartial policing by a police force that is supported um, and by the community and that we have this um, collaborative partnership between the community and the police to keep our community safe. Any further comments? Mr. Pitts? 
Yeah, I'd just like to make a couple comments. And um, I'd also like to, to thank uh, Mr. Thomas and Mr. Trapp and Mr. Ruffin for all your work uh, in, in getting us to this point. Um, I, I know that all of you have done an incredible amount of work, and it is very heartening to see all of the different stakeholders uh, come together in support uh, where there has been so much disagreement uh, in the past. Uh, that said, you know, I think that, that this is uh, the easy part, uh, so to speak, and um, it'll, the, the process of developing a plan will be difficult, and then uh, obviously implementing the plan will be, will be very difficult. Um, but it's important to uh, embrace the philosophy tonight. It's important to show the community that the leadership uh, of, of this city has has thought it important enough to make this statement uh, this evening. When it comes to the issues of uh, morale in the department, of staffing in the department, um, these are things that you know we are, have been problems uh, for quite a while. But one of the things that is most pleasing to me to hear is uh, reports back from you know, officers in the COU unit who have had the time and the resources and the ability to engage in their communities and to make a real impactful difference and to hear that, that some of those officers are the ones who feel most engaged with their jobs and most committed to their communities. And I think that that's, if, if we're able to offer that opportunity to more of, of, of our hardworking officers across the department, I think that that will go, uh, that will m make a difference in improving the morale, which in turn will make an important difference in improving the lives and the safety of everybody in our community. So this is important uh, tonight. And I, I, wanna, I want everybody though to understand that the hard work is, is about to begin. Mm -hmm. And everybody who is in agreement tonight may not be in agreement in a few months. Uh, but we need to make sure that we continue forward and address those differences and continue pushing forward to put some real teeth behind uh, this resolution that I expect we will be adopting shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Mr. Scallon. Yeah, just, just a couple of uh, observations here. I, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with uh, Tracy wilson Camp that uh, that the changes that we're talking about here are paramount. Uh, the cost is, is, is somewhat secondary, but the costs are real as well. And if you're talking about uh, 128 officers, that's uh, probably never gonna happen uh, in my lifetime or for this community. Uh, maybe a more modest uh, request at some point, and I'm not sure when what that point will be, um, will be something on the, in the nature of maybe 30 or 40 officers, perhaps. But we're talking then $2 million per officer. And that's, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I mean, this, the, the whole idea of community policing, when I got started on the city council in 2007, was part of, my, part of the platform, had to do with referring to uh, what some of the leaders in this field, uh, Kathy Lanier and, uh, and uh, Charles Ramsey, uh, in places like Washington, D.C. and Cincinnati, in uh, Chicago and uh, and, uh, and in Philadelphia, um, they had uh, an entire career of the police chiefs in those places of of dealing with this idea that has been percolating in this community probably for the last uh, ten or fifteen years. Um, so finally, we've come to a document uh, to the credit of uh, some of the some of my colleagues on the on the city council who pushed this. Um, and, and it's a starting point. This is not the end point by, by any means. Uh, and we're, we're just starting on this journey. Um, but all of those things are going to be necessary uh, for all of us to come together, to pull together, to try and get some of these changes. The change is paramount, but the costs are very real. And I think we ought to look at this with our eyes open in terms of uh, how, what, what leadership is necessary to drive this process, but also what kind of budgetary considerations are necessary to make sure that it's implemented properly. That's where we're headed, and that's why I, I certainly will be uh, uh, supporting this, uh, this resolution. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll on R23-18? 
Council Bill 2318, Mr. Trapp? Yes. Mr. Scala? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Pitzer? Yes. Ms. Peters? Yes. Mr. Treese? Aye. Mr. Ruffin? Yes. And moving on to resolution 24-18.